Funding for Shaper Illus is provided by Squarespace, the sponsor of today's video. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. A couple years back, I ranked every Disney Renaissance film. Logically, the next step would be to rank every Disney film from the following decade. Oh. Yeah, the 2000s were kind of a weird time for Disney animation, where they didn't really know what they wanted to be anymore, and they just kind of made whatever they felt like, throwing everything against the wall and seeing what would stick. I mean, the first movie they made this decade was a follow-up to a 60-year-old visual concert, and the last movie they made was a regular old 2D animated musical, the only one they did since the 90s. They flipped between 2D and 3D animation, tried out all sorts of different tones from action to crude comedy, and they even made the cinematic equivalent of watching paint dry, so honestly, we're in for a wild ranking. Oh, speaking of which, no, the wild is not part of the Disney animated canon. Don't comment and tell me that it's missing from the list, I'm not watching it again. We've got 12 movies that fall on such significant extremes of the quality spectrum that it's absurd. So, let's get started. Disappointment in the game of life. Dinosaur is the most boring movie I have ever seen in my entire life. What? My number one thought when watching this movie was, perhaps I treated the good dinosaur too harshly. That's how genuinely dull Dinosaur is. I don't even have much to say about it because good lord, there's nothing to talk about. It's nothing but CG abominations walking through photorealistic landscapes for 82 minutes straight. The only worth this movie has are through its effects, which I'm sure were pretty groundbreaking in 2000, but look absolutely horrible today. Day. The true travesty of this movie is the fact that despite the awful dated animation, the first 10 dialogueless minutes were actually really cool, with a really excellent score to boot. But yeah, the moment the characters start talking, it all goes to shit. No charm, no dramatic weight, no levity, nothing. Nothing of worth here whatsoever. This is the worst Disney animated movie I've ever seen by a landslide, but it's not even worth getting mad over. It didn't insult me with its persistent awfulness like Cars 2 or Turbo, it's just pure unadulterated boredom. The only time I felt anything throughout this entire experience was whenever the love monkey opened his mouth. I felt an overwhelming urge to strangle him. Up next, <laughs> Chicken Little. <laughs> I actually really liked Chicken Little as a kid. I thought it was really funny and off the wall and one of my favorite Disney movies at the time. This is why kids shouldn't have opinions. Chicken Little is one of the worst animated movies I've ever seen. I can't believe Disney actually stooped this low. Like, holy shit, you have to try to make a film this awful. This movie was the victim of an insanely troubled production with a buttload of studio interference that actively made the movie worse at every turn. My sincerest apologies to Mark Dindal, who now has this piece of shit on his resume until the end of time. It wasn't his fault it turned out like this. He wanted to make a good movie. Oh geez, oh man, I don't even know where to start. And whenever I don't know where to start, I make an out of nowhere Shrek comparison. But this time, it's warranted. This movie wants what Shrek has so badly. It's a fairy tale parody with pop culture references and pop songs and every character's a dick and the animation is hideous and seriously this is the exact movie that the people who hate Shrek say Shrek is. Don't compare Shrek to this shit. Don't invoke his name. Everyone in this movie is either a whiny little dweeb or a gigantic asshole. It's truly remarkable what a sick and twisted nightmare world this is for the main characters, who aren't particularly entertaining themselves. The plot is about Chicken Little wanting to stop getting bullied by the town and emotionally abused by his father. So he wins a baseball game and everyone loves him now. That's it, movie over, right? Ha, <laughs> no idiot, cause now the movie's about aliens for some reason. Yes. This is a baseball movie that becomes an alien movie. I I I I can't concentrate. If it, yeah yeah, just pick one. Pick one. The only good things in this movie are three or four funny jokes and this little alien kid Kirby. Oh look at him, he's so adorable. Oh. Kirby is innocent in all this. He is to this movie what Babu Frick is to Rise of Skywalker. Man, f Chicken Little. All my homies hate Chicken Little. I'll probably give this a full-on cinematic disaster review sometime because I. I genuinely feel like this near universally hated movie isn't hated enough. But as is tradition in my rankings, I still prefer it over Dinosaur because at least I felt something watching it. Wow, we that's two whole movies that are worse than Ralph Breaks the Internet. This list is off to a great start. Fortunately, we can only go up from here.
I, 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 I mean, that, 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 that's literally how a ranking video works. Bear. 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 Oh, bear! Brother Bear is the first Disney movie I distinctly remember growing up with. I mean, I remember watching the 90s musicals, but I wasn't alive when most of those came out. No, no, Brother Bear was the first new Disney movie that came out while I was watching new Disney movies. As a result, it's a movie I have a certain nostalgia for. So you have to keep that in mind when I tell you that this movie is ASS! It's so bad, and the worst part is that it tricks you into thinking that it's gonna be good. It starts out with this wholesome story about three Native American brothers, and one of them gets killed by a bear and it leads this other brother on a revenge quest and it's sad and captivating and profound and I like it. Then they turn the main character into the titular brother bear and the movie takes a f***ing nosedive into a mountain. All of a sudden it's a trashy baby film with terrible jokes and annoying characters and I hate it. It's so annoying. It's so bad. They had something good here and they just mangle it. The real sad thing is that this plot development could work. Like the outline of the story is brilliant. Kenai gets turned into a bear after he kills a bear who turns out to be Koda's mom. Now Koda is all alone and Kenai has to make his mistake right by becoming Koda's new guardian. A sort of brother bear, if you will. That's a good idea, and there's this really great scene late in the film where Kenai realizes that he killed Koda's mom. It's tense and anxiety-inducing and great. A splash of brilliance in an otherwise tonal nightmare of a second and third act. If they just didn't destroy the movie's tone with all these horrible baby jokes, the movie could have actually been good. But it's not. One last thing I want to mention is the Phil Collins songs. Unlike in Tarzan, where they're all the same level of quality, which is pretty good despite not really suiting the narrative and characters all that well, Brother Bear's songs work on a perfect downward trajectory. And I mean a perfect one. Each song is worse than the last. But with that said, the opening song is a banger. I honestly listen to it all the time. It fits the film perfectly, and it's just a great song in its own. Better than all the Tarzan songs combined. Phil really nailed this one. Great spirits of all who live Then there's On My Way, which is just kind of average, even a little inferior to the Tarzan songs. I hate how it starts out with Coda singing the opening part only to cut to Phil Collins. Like, really, Disney? You can't let the characters sing one musical number? Not one off. And then we have this hilariously bad number at this bear amusement park, which is literally just a Barney the Dinosaur song. You can't convince me otherwise. But then, the movie's crown jewel is this horrible song that plays over the emotional climax of the film. We don't get to hear this pivotal story and character moment because of this awful borderline parody ballad. Brother Bear, I let you down. I let you down, man. I let you down. Alright, is there anything else to talk about? Um... It's pretty. I actually do kind of like the moose. The main character is voiced by Joaquin Phoenix, so literally all I hear is the Joker's voice coming out of this man bear. Nana, you won't believe this. I, I was at the top of this huge rock and all of a sudden this- It's the police, ma'am. Your son's been hit by a drunk driver. He's dead. So that's fun. I don't know, let's move on now. A cat is not a dog. I have so little to say about Bolt that it hurts. I think it's a deeply mediocre and contrived movie that has the occasional charming moment, but it's mostly pretty dull. It's absolutely ridiculous that this TV show Bolt is on goes to such insane lengths to make this dog think that the show he's on is his real life. Like, they don't do alternate takes because it'll ruin the immersion for the dog, which will apparently ruin the immersion for the audience. Does the movie not realize how insane that sounds? Do you see how many special effects this show requires? What if one of them didn't work that day and they had to redo the shot? That, that seriously never happened before? None of the actors have ever messed up in front of Bolt. Are, are you kidding me? Uh-oh, Bolt thinks his owner is in trouble and he escapes, but now he has to realize that he's not actually a super dog, just a regular dog. But he also learns that to a kid, being a regular dog is just as super as being a super dog. Why yes, movie, I have seen Toy Story before. I love watching a lamer version of Buzz Lightyear's character arc. Then there's this annoying cat with a terrible New York accent and this mildly annoying hamster, and also Bolt is voiced by John Travolta, who annoys me personally. You know what could have made this movie better? Have Bolt be voiced by Adam West. Play up his superhero tendencies even 
further. Have him be like, E gods, what is this styrofoam menace? Basically make him funny like Buzz Lightyear was. The version of Bolt we got is such a tepid and lame superhero when the concept of a dog who thinks he's a superhero could have been so much funnier. Again, Adam West. It would have been a great semi-parody of his version of Batman. You got him for the previous two Disney movies. I have no idea how you guys missed such an obvious opportunity here. The climax is really contrived and stupid. Plus, the movie is so aggressively anti-cat that it hurts. You know what? Just writing about this lame-ass movie is making me angry. I have it ranked at number 8 right now, but screw it. I think I actually liked Home on the Range better. So we're bumping that up to number 8 instead. Oh, whoops. Uh, spoilers. My bad. Because you're gonna yodel, 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 obey me. Home on the Range is a lot like home, in the sense that they're both not good, but also not nearly as bad as I was expecting. Also, they both have home in the title. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know if you noticed that, but... But they, but they do. Yeah, I remember disliking this movie a lot more as a kid, but it's not the worst thing ever. Just a mix of sometimes charming, sometimes annoying characters performing sometimes charming, sometimes annoying slapstick. Nothing more, nothing less. I kind of like this one egotistical horse who wants to prove himself, but then goes through some character development. The villain is pretty fun and enjoyable. Roseanne is the main character, so that sucks. There's a lot of burping. Uh, Steve Buscemi shows up for like five minutes late in the film and I wasn't expecting that. That was a nice surprise. Oh, and Patrick Warburton shows up for like one minute. So that, that was nice too. There's a song that's sung by a character in the film, like, like, like a musical, like, like how Disney used to make. And the song is not terrible. So that was cool. Yeah, I, I don't have anything else to say. It's not awful, which is a huge accomplishment for a film like this. Not gonna watch it again, but it was fine for one viewing. I especially like the part where the farm is being closed down! The Dutchman's Treasure! Wow! Oh boy, I wasn't looking forward to this. <sighs> Treasure Planet is okay. I've gotten a lot of requests to talk about why this movie in particular is an underrated masterpiece, and like, I'm really glad that's what all of y'all think of this movie, but yeah, I'm sorry, this just didn't work for me that well. There is one aspect of it I do consider to be truly exceptional, and that's John Silver. Honestly, one of the most interesting and well-written characters in any Disney movie. I love how he's established to the audience, but not the characters, as the twist villain. It sets him up for such exceptionally strong development over the course of the story because we actually get to see it. We see him start to care for Jim. We see him struggle between his growing conscience and the allure of the treasure. Everything involving him is believable, entertaining, and fantastic. I also like Jim Hawkins. He starts out as a bland, edgy, whatever kind of teenager, but there's some tangible development for him as well over the course of the story. He grows into his role as a hero in a more natural, believable way than most Disney protagonists. So these two characters are great. Everything else about the movie isn't. Wow, these Doppler and Amelia characters seem potentially fun and interesting. I love how the movie doesn't use them at all and shoves them into a ridiculous forced side romance. The aesthetic of this movie is unique for sure, but honestly, it was mostly just distracting and weird for me. I just don't think the old timey ships and outfits blend that well with futuristic tech at all, and it made it really difficult to get invested in the setting. The pacing of this movie is so strange. It almost feels like a completely different film halfway through when they get to Treasure Planet, and while I didn't love the first half, I definitely preferred it because it didn't have this obnoxious dickhead robot who honestly might be worse than Turk in terms of sheer annoyance. The only way I can imagine this character working is if they were voiced by the same voice actor who plays Master Shake and Gazpacho. Like, try and picture this robot with that voice. You start off as this blade of grass, and then you go inside and it's like a luge. You go down the esophagus, you're in the stomach, large intestine, small intestine, small intestine, favorite part by the way. If only, am I right? Right? And Morph... Actually, I really like Morph. He's great. Overall, I could totally see what makes this movie such a cult classic and why so many of you love it. I just can't relate. I really wish I could. I wish everything else in the movie was on the same level as John Silver and his relationship with Jim. I have nothing but respect for Ron Clements and John Musker, who fought tooth and nail to get this movie made for so many years. But for me, this is probably their weakest work, and I feel really bad about saying that since it was their longtime passion project, and it bombed spectacularly at the box office. That really sucks. But at least they got to create Tomatoa 14 years later, so honestly, I call that an absolute win. 
What's that? Three bells! You all know what three bells means, right? Free ice cream! No, you silly billies! <laughs> no! It means the sky is falling! Everybody stay calm. Let's just all check Twitter for updates on the current apocalypse. Oh no! The only thing trending on Twitter is a Minecraft YouTuber sneezed or something. I, I mean, I guess that is more important than everything else that's going on with the world. So, so yeah, I guess Twitter has good priorities. But still, if only someone made a website that could give us updates on the falling sky. Looks like we better get on that using Squarespace. Squarespace is a fantastic, intuitive, online website builder that allows you to create beautiful websites for your business or personal hobby. Present your work using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs. Display projects in customizable galleries and add password-protected pages to share private work with clients. You can even present your videos from YouTube, Vimeo, and Animoto on your Squarespace site. Add an image overlay to your video to improve your website's load speed by waiting to embed video players until playback starts. Every design automatically includes a unique mobile experience that matches the overall style of your website. So your content will look great on every device, every time. And if you don't want that, you can always disable the mobile view from Website Manager. Buying a domain from Squarespace is simple because there are no hidden fees or price hikes. Each domain comes with an ad-free parking page and free WHOIS privacy on eligible domains. Squarespace sells over 200 top-level domains so you can find the perfect name for your website. Choose a URL that ends in .com, .net, Dot org, or if you're feeling funky, you can get a more specific one like dot .art. If you're ready to share your passions or promote your business with the rest of the world, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash shapefurless to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Do you have Froggy? Do you have Froggy? <laughs> Froggy, are you in this match, crotch? Out of every Disney movie that came out in the 2000s, arguably the most divisive decade in Disney's entire history, would you believe me if I said that I have the most mixed feelings about the princess and the frog? It feels like this should be a slam dunk for me, right? It's a 2D musical. Literally, what more could I ask for? That's what I thought too. But to me, this is weaker than every Disney Renaissance musical, Pocahontas excluded, and it pretty much all ties back to the story. It's basically got the exact same problem as Brother Bear, just not quite as drastic. The opening is great. I love Tiana, and I really care for her plight. Naveen seems like a pretty fun character as well. Dr. Facilier is a really smooth villain. The songs are great. Everything seems to be going well, and the main character's a frog now. Oh. Hey Disney, how about you stop turning people of color into animals? It's a really weird and gross trend. This studio did a ton of this decade, so I wanted to say that right off the bat. But like, in these other movies, it at least makes sense story-wise. Kuzco needs to be taught a lesson because he's a gigantic asshole. Kenai needs to be taught a lesson and be a brother bear to this kid. Later on, we got Pixar's soul, and by being a cat, Joe learns a lesson about enjoying the small moments in his life. And in this movie, Naveen becoming a frog makes sense because he's very egotistical and needs to be taken down a peg. See, this trend that stunningly never happens to white people for some reason at least works for these specific characters and their arcs. Now, riddle me this, dear viewer. What the f did the- What the f did Tiana do to turn- What the f did Tiana do to deserve- What the f did Tiana do to- What the f did Tiana- What the f did Tiana- the... This is the hardest thing I've ever had to say. What the f*** did Tiana do to deserve turning into a frog? Like, if we can somehow ignore the fact that Disney's first black princess is a frog for 80% of the movie, how does her being a frog tie into her previous motivation of following her dream and opening her restaurant? Is there any significant character flaw in her that was fixed by her experience being a frog? The closest thing I could figure is that she apparently works too hard and she doesn't need to follow her dream because love is all she really needed. And being a frog somehow helped her realize this? This is stupid. How does kissing a frogman even turn her into a frog? Did Dr. Facilier really take the time to program this into the curse he put on Naveen? Did he expect Naveen to kiss someone? Did he really think to himself, oh man, it would be so hilarious if some lady tried kissing this frog and then got turned into a frog herself, even though the plan was to keep him locked up forever so that wouldn't even be a possibility. Okay, whatever. Both our main characters are frogs and the stuff I liked about the first half hour is gone now. Cool. Is the middle chunk of this movie gonna be good? No, not really actually. There are some charming moments since these characters are good and I like this trumpet alligator, but a lot of it is just shitty slapstick filler with annoying crocodiles and irritating hunters and this stupid ass firefly. I don't like him. When the villain steps on him later in the movie, I actually laughed. 
It was hilarious. And the third act was decent enough, despite all the convoluted plot points being thrown in all different directions. So yeah, the story of this film kind of sucks, honestly. This movie is absolutely carried by its songs and its characters, and even then, both of those are kind of a mixed bag. The highs are high. Friends on the other side is awesome. Almost There looks really cool and makes me wish Disney would do unique 2D styles for their musical numbers in their 3D movies. I mean, why not? And actually, I really love Dig a Little Deeper. It's one of the most underrated Disney songs ever. Give it a listen, because it's a bop. Down in New Orleans reprise is great. The original is okay. The Human Again knockoff song is alright. Better than Human Again anyway. The Firefly songs are lame, and I legit forgot the Going Down the Bayou song existed. As for the characters, Tiana, Naveen, Facilier, Louis, and Mama Odie are all great. Charlotte and her John Goodman daddy were okay, but as a white person, I legit kind of felt patronized by their existence. Like, Disney didn't think I'd get invested in the story unless there were nice white people in it. Uh, Lawrence was dummy thick, so he gets a pass, and Ray can go die! Oh wait, he did! Awesome! I honestly can't decide if I love or hate this movie. It has so many hallmarks of Disney at its 2D musical best, and yet it's got so much stupid shit in it that it really doesn't hold up that well compared to the Disney Renaissance films. But I guess it's okay. It's an okay movie that just barely cracked the top half of this list, which should really go to show you that this decade of Disney films was kinda ass. Fortunately, there are five really good movies left to talk about, so let's get into those. In the future, Entertainment will be randomly generated. I'm deeply shocked that I liked Meet the Robinsons as much as I did. I thought it was okay as a kid, but no man, it's honestly really good, if a bit flawed in a few areas. Most of these flaws can be found with the titular Robinson family. Every scene involving them felt like the filmmakers were throwing everything against the wall and none of them were sticking. Except the Adam West pizza guy, he, he was good. Everything else was just kind of structureless randomness for the sake of structureless randomness, and I kind of hated most of the scenes with the family. I mean, why do they have to be this big with this many underdeveloped weirdos? It just made for a really tedious experience. And the way the villain is defeated is weird too. Like, why did Lewis have to go to them in person and tell them to their face that he wasn't going to invent them? Like, couldn't he just think about not inventing them and that could fix everything? I don't know, that stuff, plus a couple other weird tonal killers here and there, hold this movie back from true greatness. But despite its failures, this movie keeps moving forward and becomes one of the funniest, smartest, most consistently innovative movies Disney has ever put out. It's so damn good in so many ways. Out of all the movies on this list, this one's probably the second funniest. There are so many hysterical running gags and little moments here and there that I was legitimately taken aback. I was not expecting this movie's writing to be as sharp and clever as it was. Lewis and Wilbur are solid enough characters, but my god, Bowler Hat Guy is one of the funniest and most entertaining Disney villains ever. I love his backstory, both in terms of how hilariously petty and legitimately sad it is. It's so thematically genius how this guy refuses to grow and move on from his past, in sharp contrast to Lewis's desire to keep moving forward. And the way Lewis has to grapple with the stuff in his past versus the future he learns about. Oh my god, it's so good! This movie is just so brilliant on so many levels, and it's funny, and it's emotional, and it's subversive. Oh man, go watch it! It's more flawed than the average Disney movie, which is a real shame, but then again, every time it stumbles, it picks itself back up again just like the main character. This one's definitely going on the list of movies I need to make a full video on, eventually, maybe, possibly. Ain't Sephiroth the one who's supposed to be the dark part of Cloud's heart? Fantasia 2000 was a magnificent start to this decade of Disney films, mostly. I liked almost every part to some extent, and in fact, I might as well do a mini ranking of all the parts, why not? The celebrity portions don't get a ranking because most of them suck and kill the tone. I like James Earl Jones though, he can stay. Number eight, the Tin Soldier one. I thought it was really lame and didn't fit the music very well at all. No thank you, Bob. Number seven, the Flamingo and Yo-Yo one. Cute and funny, but also aggressively short and tonally a little weird. Number six, the Butterfly one. Definitely has its moments of coolness and beauty, but some of it wasn't as visually stimulating as it thinks it is. Number five, Donald's Ark. Very cute and visually interesting, though I find it absolutely ludicrous that Donald and Daisy didn't encounter each other once during the 40 days and nights spent on this arc. 
How was that? How is that even possible? Number four, The Sorcerer's Apprentice. It's a classic. This was actually my first time watching it, and I think it's great. They even got Master Kingdom Hearts to make an appearance. Truly incredible. Number three, The Space Whales. Truly magnificent. There were a few slow parts, but mostly this was a spectacle to behold. A transcendent, dreamlike experience. Good use of CG as well that still holds up. Number two, The Anime Nature Girl. This came close to being number one, but fell a bit short because I feel like the main conflict was resolved a bit too quickly and easily. Otherwise, it's flawless. One of the most breathtaking things Disney has ever created. Just so magnificent on so many levels, I can't sing its praises enough. Number one, The New York One. Visually incredible, fits the music so well, has such a unique vibe. I love basically everything about it. It needs to be seen to be believed. So damn great. Yeah, I mean, this is a hard film to talk about because it's less of a film and more of a visual concert, but as a visual concert, I thought it was great. I liked everything except the toy soldier and the celebrities, and it's very, very good. You should watch it and stuff. Also, I should probably watch the original sometime, huh? Oh yeah, it's all coming together. Ha! Boom, baby! I have a whole video on the Emperor's New Groove already, but TLDR, this movie's a bop. I don't think it's a masterpiece, but I do think it's great. One of, if not the funniest Disney movie, with stellar animation, fantastic characters, and just this incredible sense of unbridled fun that few movies can accurately replicate. I think it's a little lightweight in terms of its runtime, and it really could have used some songs. They fit the tone of the movie perfectly and make it even more enjoyable. I will never get over the death of Snuff Out the Light, one of the best Disney villain songs ever if it was only allowed to exist as part of the finished movie. I think the pacing of many emotional moments can feel rushed as well. I want to feel things at certain points, but the film is just always zooming and won't slow down for any feels whatsoever. If it had those feels and those songs, boom, instant 10 out of 10. But as is, it's an 8 out of 10 experience with a 10 out of 10 score in the pure comedy department. At times, it almost feels too clever and funny to be a Disney movie, especially an early 2000s Disney movie. It's also so miraculous that it turned out this great in spite of its notoriously rough production. Honestly, looking at the movie, you could never tell. A sharp contrast to modern Disney movies where you can so easily tell when a production was troubled. I have a ton more I could say about this movie, but I said it all already, so check out the video I said it in. I just really love this one, and chances are, so do you. Oh, you suck it! Oh! Atlantis The Lost Empire is so damn great! How come none of y'all never told me? Like, seriously, I'm absolutely floored by how good this movie is. I wasn't expecting it at all, but I guess that was my mistake, considering how this movie's directors are the same ones behind Beauty and the Beast, Hunchback of Notre Dame, and the Madagascar Penguins and the Christmas Caper. I am so sorry I ever doubted them. The biggest positive by far is the cast of characters. Like, Milo's a fine, typical Disney protagonist, Kida's a pretty solid princess, Rourke is a good enough villain, blah blah blah. But holy shit, the side characters in this are amazing. They all have these distinct backstories and personalities and styles of humor, and they play off of each other insanely well. God, they all deserve a TV show. Make an Atlantis TV show, Disney. P -p Put it on Disney+. Plus. I, I know you canceled one when this movie bombed at the box office, but for the love of God, bring it back. The animation is also really stellar and distinct from any other Disney film. It's got this comic book aesthetic that just looks incredible. It makes every scene just pop and I can't get enough of it. The story legitimately had a lot of mystery surrounding it. I wasn't sure what was going to happen or what the Atlantean culture would be like and I think that's the hallmark of a really strong sci-fi storyline. I also like how adult this movie feels, not just in its jokes and animation style and constant death, but in its messages. Like there's a legit strong anti-imperialist message here. The guy who's here to plunder an ancient civilization and kill off its inhabitants in order to get rich is the villain. Which, yeah. Exactly. I don't even know what else to say, man. This film is just magnificent. Sometimes its story can be a bit clunky, and I wish we could have gotten even more of the side characters. But overall, this movie is everything Pocahontas should have been. It's everything Sinbad should have been. Hell, y'all are really gonna hate me for saying this, but it's everything Treasure Planet should have been. I'm shocked that more people haven't told me to check this one out in particular, because it's quickly become one of my favorite Disney movies. I don't even miss the songs like I do with Emperor's New Groove. I think they hit the perfect tonal sweet spot for an exciting, mystifying, absolutely incredible action adventure. Please, for the love of God, check this movie out. It's so good, you guys. You have no idea. Yeah, this shouldn't come as much of a surprise. Lilo and Stitch is just the best Disney film to come out of the 2000s, and one of my favorite Disney films in general. I didn't actually grow up with it, but man, I wish I did. 
It's just incredible in every way. It's from the duo who would go on to make How to Train Your Dragon for DreamWorks, and by god, they've just cracked the code on how to make perfectly paced movies about an unlikely friendship between a quirky loner and a seemingly vicious creature who turns out to be good deep down. The bond between Stitch and Lilu- Lilu? The bond between Stitch and Lilo is absolutely precious, and it's such a brilliant pairing. Lilo is a troubled, destructive child who's hard to deal with a lot of the time, and Stitch is like a twisted alien counterpart. A being who was created as a tool for destruction. But seeing them come together, seeing Lilo finally find a friend who appreciates her quirky tendencies, seeing Stitch develop and find purpose beyond what he was created for, all of this is just absolutely brilliant, funny, and heartwarming stuff. If that was all this movie was, it would already be pretty great. But of course, it doesn't stop there. This movie also gives us this heartbreaking story about a broken family that's portrayed so uncomfortably realistically. They bicker and fight just like any sisters, but they're both having trouble adjusting to the fact that Nani basically has to be Lilo's parent now. It's not a relationship either of them want, but they have to adjust to it so Lilo doesn't get taken away. The conflict in this movie is so tense because it's so realistic, and it's not the sort of thing you ever see depicted in Disney movies. And that Aloha Oi scene is just so devastating in so many ways. Oh my god, it's just one of the best scenes Disney has ever made. I really only have good things to say about this movie. It's funny, it's heartwarming, it has amazing watercolor art direction, the characters are all likable, and nearly all of them have great arcs over the course of the story. I'd be lying if I said the human stuff wasn't better than the alien stuff, but I think the fact that they blend together as well as they do is a testament to how expertly constructed this movie is. This is one of my favorite Disney movies and easily their best film to come out in the 2000s. This was certainly one of Disney's rockiest decades ever, but I think it all came together in the end thanks in no small part to fantastic films like this.